it's one o'clock on Tuesday, May 3rd, so you must be watching Science at Soast. I'm your host, Pete McGuinness-Mark, streaming live from beautiful downtown Honolulu. Every week, we get a new graduate student to come in and talk about her research, and today I'm really excited. We've got Rose Gallo, who is a volcanologist and a petrologist, and she's going to be talking about the 2018 eruption of Kilauea Volcano. And that's really good because Science at SOST is all about the School of Ocean, Earth Science and Technology. So Rose, welcome to the show. I'm delighted to have you on. Kilauea is one of my favorite research areas. So welcome again. Thank you very much. And um, I usually ask the students uh, if they can just say a little bit about themselves. I understand you're a second year PhD candidate, but where have you done some of your earlier studies? Um, so prior to joining UH Manoa, I did my master's at Northern Arizona University, and I did my bachelor's degree at the University of British Columbia. And I understand that um, your master's degree at uh, Northern Arizona uh, was on a different type of volcano. Yes, very different from Kilauea. I studied Campi Flegre Caldera, um, which is a very large, very explosive volcanic system, though it has in common that it's also still active and in an area where an even more significant population could be affected by future eruptions. And I think I'm correct in saying Campo Flegre is just west of Naples in uh, Italy. Um, yes. Well, part of Naples is actually in it, uh, but most of Naples most is of east of it. All right. So you're, you're trying to study um, a little bit safer uh, volcanic eruption uh, for your PhD. Um, I know you weren't here during the uh, 2018 eruption, which is what we're talking about today. But if we could go to the first slide, maybe you can just lead us through a little bit of what the uh, uh, eruption history of both Kilauea and perhaps even the Big Island as a whole was like. Um, so th this map is highlighting first on the left where the most recent um, eruptions have been since I think about um, the 1500s. Um, so you can see that most of the surface of Kilauea has actually been covered in new lava flows since that time period. And there's also been quite a number of lava flows on Mauna Loa, but Kilauea is by far the more active of the two. And then on the right hand side, um, it's showing the east rift zone of Kilauea. Kilauea has two rift zones, the southwest and the east rift zone. Um, and my area of study is the lower east rift zone, so the furthest east portion um, on the eastern flank of Kilauea. Okay, for our viewers, can you explain a little bit more about what you mean by a rift zone? Um, sure. So Kilauea's sort of areas of concentrated eruption are the summit crater, um, Halimaumau, where you can some, sometimes, such as now, see a lava lake. And then there's two other areas where eruptions tend to be concentrated, um, sort of curvy linear features um, that go off to the southwest and to the east from the summit of Kilauea. And these are just locations where eruptions tend to be concentrated because of the structural features of Kilauea where openings can be created for magma to flow through and eventually come to the surface. So think of the rift zone as having an underground pathway, perhaps, for the movement of magma. Um, and I think you know, the, the older viewers might remember Kapoho eruption in 1960, or Mauna Ulu in the late 60s, or even Puuo from 83 onwards. They're all on the rift zone. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. OK. All right. And so um, does Kilauea produce these lavas uh, along the rift zone, or do they come from like beneath Halimamo? Um, Typically a combination in the 2018 eruption and also in most of the other historic 
eruption in the Lower East Rift Zone. So there's the 1960, as you said, the 1955, the 1840, and the 1790 are considered the historic eruptions. And most of them include a combination of magmas that have been stored underneath the rift zone since some previous eruption when they traveled there and they've just been sitting there cooling under the ground, um, changing in composition a little bit. Um, so that will usually be combined with some magmas that are coming down um, along the available pathways from the magma chambers beneath the summit. I always think of a, a rift zone as the plumbing system of a volcano. It's sort of, I know they're not pipes in, in the traditional sense, but yeah, sometimes pipes get blocked and that's where the magma resides and things like that. But the 2018 eruption was truly spectacular. Um, I think the second slide will show um, much more detail what was going on. This is close to uh, Kapoho again, right? Right down uh, by the coast. Yes, the, the main phase of it entered into that area. The, and the map just shows um, some of the phases into which the 2018 eruption was divided by researchers based on a combination of the chemical composition of the lavas and the eruptive styles. Okay, I, and we see some nice colored uh, lava flows. Um, over what kind of time period uh, were these erupted on the surface? Do, do you know what the dates were? Are they all in 2018, but uh, is it a matter of days or minutes or? The, the entire eruption took months. It began on May 3rd and ended approximately August 4th. Um, the majority of that time period from sort of the end of May to the end of the eruption was um, just phase three, the dark blue, which um, makes up the majority of the eruptive volume, a lot of which cannot even really be truly perceived on the map because so much of it went into the ocean and has for formed sort of a, a vertical pile off the coast. Okay, okay. And um, I think you got some great pictures from the US Geological Survey in slide three, just showing were these typical kinds of views um, in your studies? You must have looked at the, uh, the, the eruption types. What, what do we have here and any idea of the scale of these lava flows? Yeah, so the upper two images are from the earlier phases of the eruption, and they're showing that in the very early phase of the eruption, there wasn't a large volume of lava being erupted, and the lavas were sort of sticky and slow moving and didn't travel very far. So in some places, like in the uh, the top right picture, it's all that was formed was a small fissure opening in the forest and a pile of spattery lava. And in other places, there were short lava flows that moved um, mostly slowly through the community. Whereas in the lower two images, that's from the last phase of the eruption when these um, enormous lava flows and flow fields were developing, and um, you have the large flow channels and the centralized cone. Some of our viewers, I, I think the first two images, is that Leilani Estates where the, the vents started to open up? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So any idea why did the eruption evolve this way? Why did it start off with just small volumes being erupted on the surface. And then uh, the, the last two, the bottom two slides you showed, quite spectacular. You know, with, um, any understanding on why it sort of changed its character? Um, what we believe happened in this eruption and also in a similar fashion in prior eruptions um, is that you have these small-ish um, magma bodies sitting within the rift zone um, that were placed there during previous eruptions. They've been sitting there cooling for some time. And then when an eruption begins, magma is coming down through the piping of the rift zone um, from the summit. But before it can come out at the surface, it pushes out the old magma ahead of it, which is cooler and thicker because it's been sitting around um, and crystallizing 
for probably decades. Um, so when that magma comes out first, it begins erupting. It There isn't very much of it, um, and it comes out slower. But then once that lava has been mostly pushed out, it begins to mix in with the, um, the new magmas coming down from the summit reservoirs. And then that magma takes over. So the, the last phase of this eruption was really not entirely, but almost exclusively the magmas that would have been coming down from the, uh, the central reservoirs. And they are much more fluid hotter and quite a large volume of material. <laughs> you, know, you you mentioned something that it might lava or magma might still be fluid after several decades. So um, they don't chill uh, very quickly. Is it possible that you have hot magma underground for decades after the eruption? Yes, uh, absolutely. I think we should assume that the 2018 eruption probably emplaced some small magma bodies of its own perhaps into the spaces um, left left behind by previous things that were evacuated and we should expect that the, the end of that magma to be cooling beneath the lower east rift zone right now um, and it will be changing the composition as it cools and perhaps in some future eruption it will be pushed out at the beginning of the eruption. And I think slide four will be a good time to uh, just tell us a little bit more. Um, here we're seeing part of the East Rift Zone, but um, particularly your kind of work, which is, I believe, a petrologist. She studies you know, the, the chemical composition of the rocks. Um, can you talk us through this really elegant diagram here with the uh, the five different labels at the bottom? Yeah, so this represents sort of um, one model for how the plumbing inside the east drift zone of Kilauea is set up. So you can see that there are two magma bodies um, shown underneath the summit of Kilauea. Um, stacked above one another. Um, and it's not like entirely known which one the magma would come more directly from during a rift zone eruption. Um, most people tend to think the deeper body, but it's, it's not certain. Um, so you have connectivity between the summit magma chambers and the rift zone. And then in the rift zone, you have all these small magma bodies associated with previous eruptions that are just kind of sitting there. Um, and you can see that the the magma that would be flowing down from the stomach, it's interacting with those. The and, and just to, just to help the viewers, um, the the gray part presumably is the land surface. Yes. And then the light brown is essentially going deeper and deeper underground, right? So this is a three dimensional image yes. or artist artist rendition. And, and what are the numbers? mean you you've got different types of uh I, I see mafic basalt and and they say at different places what what is the significance of that so that that's showing a um a hypothesis for where the different chemical components of the 2018 eruption come from um so you have there was three chemical end members involved in the eruption um, the dark blue um, is what erupted at the end of the eruption, and that's proposed to come from the summit magma chambers. Um, the green high titanium basalt is what erupted at the very beginning of the eruption, and that's thought to be derived from magma bodies that were perhaps formed around 1955 or 1960. Um, and then there is the andesite, which erupted at just one fissure sort of uh, midway through the early part of the eruption, a very unique composition for Kilauea. Nobody was aware of any andesites erupting prior to 2018. And um, all of the compositions in the eruption are derived from one of those three end members or some combination of them. So it, it's showing the potential magma bodies each of these would be sourced from. And then it's showing the Puna Day site magma body ne next door. Now, I, I sort of imagine activity at Kilauea as being fed by a mantle plume, a, a hot body of rock 
deep beneath Hawaii. Um, but you're seeing five different types of magma being erupted. Is that just because some of these magma bodies have sort of sat underground, changing their composition? How do they change their composition? Yes, precisely. If they if they've been in the the shallow crust for some period of time, um, they begin to cool and they begin to form minerals as they cool. And uh -huh. then the remaining um, fluid magma will have a different composition um, than it had before the minerals were taken out because the chemical composition of the minerals will be subtracted from the composition of the magma. Okay, so, so the original magma coming up beneath Hale Mau Mau starts to differentiate um, to produce these other minerals. And I think uh, slide five will show just some examples of um, what you might be able to see. And these, these are what? The images of what kind of rock? So th these images um, are showing melt inclusions in the three common mineral types that are found in um, Kilauea basalts, olivine, pyroxenes, and plagioclase. Um, and they're showing one of the, the core subject of my study is trying to um, look at the compositions and particularly that of the volatile um, molecules like water and carbon dioxide that would be in these magma chambers beneath the rift zone um, and to get the most the best preserved compositions of these things as they were in the magma chambers we have to look at the magma that was trapped inside the minerals that formed in those magma chambers so the melt inclusions are um volcanic glass that represents that um trapped magma inside the minerals these are fascinating images but can you explain to the viewers a bit more first of all what the size is but they don't look like rocks to me um <laughs> they they they, you know, uh, they almost look transparent um how did you get these images yeah so so these are thin sections, um, microscope slides. They're, they're very thin slices of rocks. And so when you have them sliced that thinly and you look at them under a microscope, the light passes through them and you're able to see them in this way. So th these images are quite small. Um, they're, we're looking at individual minerals that are probably um, a, a couple millimeters across and the melt inclusions inside them um, are tens of microns at most. Okay, uh, and would it be fair to say that each one of the, um, the, the five different types of magma you've been studying have different numbers of crystals or different crystal sizes or even compositions? Um, yes, A, each of the like the, the different phases in the 2018 eruption. Well, there's plenty of overlap. For example, all of the phases contain some olivine. Um, mm -hmm. The olivine has slightly different chemical components in the different phases of the eruption. And for example, the last phase has almost exclusively olivine, whereas the other two phases have a lot more plagioclase and pyroxenes as well. Okay. Would it be fair to think of these almost as different fingerprints of different uh, rock types that you, know, you can take a thin section like the ones we just saw and you could say, oh, it must have come out of the vent at this time or something like that? Yeah, I mean, I feel like that's kind of the, the first step of petrology is that you um, look at a little sample of a rock that's meant to represent some phase of the eruption or some rock body and distinguish them based on the minerals and their shapes and sizes and textures and compositions that you can determine. I, I guess what I was uh, thinking of is if I just handed you a thin section like the ones in the slides, could you tell me either where it was in the whole sequence of activity? on the volcano or which vent it came from? Are they that different that you can uh, pinpoint the, 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 the 
phase of the activity where there was erupted? Um, within the 2018 eruption, yeah. yes. I, if you told me it was hmm. just, this is from the 2018 eruption, tell me which phase it is. Yes, if I had the whole history of Kilauea, no, there is a lot of similarity. Um, Kilauea produces a very limited range of compositions and lots of lot rocks that look quite similar to one another. But the 2018 eruption was pretty unique in terms of the compositional diversity um, within it. Interesting, interesting. Now, um, we've seen some slides of where uh, the eruption was down at the coast. I think slide six will show us that it wasn't just restricted to activity down at the coast, that these are a couple of air photographs. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what we're looking at here? Yeah, so th these are images showing the um, summit caldera of Kilauea before and after the 2018 eruption. Mm -hmm. um, and what they're showing is that the caldera significantly collapsed throughout the eruption. There wasn't really um, a distinct eruption occurring in the summit caldera and that there wasn't really any um, new lavas erupting from that location, but because of the withdrawal of the magma from the magma chambers below the summit so that it could go to the rift zones, there was no longer support underneath the rocks at the summit of Kilauea and the caldera began to fall in. Um, and as the rocks sort of were falling into the withdrawing magma and bashing against one another, they did put up um, sort of a plume of ash, but it wasn't mostly fresh material at all. Maybe some of our viewers have been out to uh, the volcano area, but th the size that we're looking at here, um, the caldera is about what? three by five kilometers in size. And the, on the left image, the, the white smoke, that's coming from Halimama, which was what, 500 meters across or something like that. So it's a, quite a big feature. And what you're saying is that the collapse that we saw um, was due to magma that was once underneath Halimama moving down the rift zone so that's the, the source. Um, what about the, the, the mantle plume beneath Halimamo? That was unable to keep things going? Yeah, I mean, there, there should be at least constant sort of new supply of magma from the mantle plume, but it's only coming up at, um, well, we don't, I don't think anybody knows exactly the, the rate that it's coming up, but they're, they're sort, it cannot, come up as fast as it likes to replenish relative to the rate of the eruption that's recurring. So it's probably still refilling now, and it has refilled enough to put um, a lava lake back in the summit crater, um, but it took a few years um, to fill up the magma chamber again to the degree that we were gonna see lava at the surface. And probably would that slower supply rate um be one of the reasons the eruption stopped. It, it, it just ran out of uh, new molten rock. Um, I, I think, yes, I mean, it did not run out of magma in the summit caldera. Like it did not empty the summit caldera, but at a certain point, um, the pressure was low enough that there wasn't, um, it, the magma was no longer being forced down into the rift zone because the pressure um, was low in the summit magma chambers. Now this collapse, uh, the, the next slide, slide seven, starts to show us a little bit more of this uh, uh, amazing collapse event. Um, I think these are radar images, aren't they? Um, yeah, they are. It's a digital elevation model. So I, I believe it comes from um, some sort of radar survey that's done aerially. Yeah. Yeah. And, and we've got two time periods here. And I think, uh, so if viewers look at where Halimamo Crater is, um, uh, and we go on to the next slide, it starts showing huge changes uh, and, and the scale of one kilometer, yeah, it's like five eighths of a mile. Um, do you know how much the collapse, how deep the collapse was? 
Yeah, so inside um, Polymama Crater, um, it's subsided by um, approximately 500 meters, I believe, whereas the sort of whole caldera floor, it was a little bit more than 160 meters. Right, so that's you know, like a uh, 1500 feet drop in the middle and you know, maybe 400 feet uh, on the outside. So, yeah, incredible that uh, you know, the landscape can change that much. So what's it like now? I know you're not doing research on uh, uh, the Cohen activity, but I think the next slide would show us a little bit about how even this was, I guess, uh, just over a month ago, the, the survey put this map out. What, what, what's happening now? Um, so right now there is, um, once again, an eruption just in the summit crater. Um, there's an active lava lake, which it's possible for visitors to view um, from a designated viewpoint within the national park. Um, and this eruption has been ongoing since uh, late last year. Um, and there was another eruption that occurred in um, early 2021, started in late 2020, um, after there having been a, a gap since the end of the 2018 eruption where there was no activity in the summit. So now there's an active lava lake again, and you can um, see the molten lava. Right. Have you seen the, the, the lava lake? They're, they're meant to be spectacular, particularly at night. Yes, it's beautiful. I, I went at night um, a couple of times, um, several months apart, and it looked quite mm -hmm. different both times in terms of, um, well, the, the center of the activity was the same, but in terms of the degree of exposure of molten material. And one of the times I went, there was sort of a waterfall of lava cascading down a feature in the lava lake. Um, so it, it's quite um, changeable in its small features, at least over time. Sounds terrific, Rose. Well, unfortunately, we've run out of time. Uh, I wish I could uh, spend more time talking about Kilauea Volcano, but let me just remind the viewers, you have been watching Science at SOST. I've been your host, Pete McGinnis-Mark, and my guest today has been Rose Gallo talking about the 2018 eruption of Kilauea Volcano. So thank you for watching. Please join us again next week. And thank you, Rose, for being on the show. And so until next week, it's goodbye for now. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.